What's up everybody? Today we're going to be taking a look at this Marshall JMP1 preamp. I got a really good deal on this one for two reasons. One, it has encountered some damage. I can bend that back. I'm not really worried about the cosmetics as long as it works right. And two, it also came with the step-up transformer because this unit is from Europe and runs on 240 volts. Kind of funny that it even included the European plug here. Now that's great. We could use this, but we don't need to. These units come with dual tapped primary, so we can convert this to 120 volts just by moving a wire or two. I gotta take a look at the schematic, but let's open it up and get inside there and see if there's anything else we need to do. Well, we should be able to bend this back just by putting it on a vise. Well, that's pretty straight. I mean, it's a lot better than it was. So that's how it is now. I mean, looking at it from the front, doesn't look bad at all. You can barely tell that it was ever bent. I'm going to put it in there one more time just to see if I can flatten it out anymore. But that is good, and I'm, I'm happy with that result. Yeah, it's sitting up pretty straight. I don't really think there's a whole lot else you can do. That looks pretty damn good to me. See, that was easy enough, so I'm never worried about seeing damage like that, as long as the insides are good. So let's take this chassis panel off and look at the condition of the inside of the amp. So here's what we got inside here. Everything looks pretty good. The top of this capacitor isn't completely smooth, but it's not bulging on all sides. It may be okay. It might be time for a recap. I mean, they are about 32 years old. At this point, this amp is from 1992, as can be seen from the barcode, the serial number on the barcode on the transformer, and also starts with 92. That would be 1992. Looks like we've got the original Marshall tubes in here, or Marshall label tubes. Probably leave those alone. Preamp tubes last a lot longer than people think. If there's nothing wrong with them and they sound good, then just leave them be. We do need to address a few other things than the amp alongside of converting it for use for 120 volts. Mainly it's this battery right here. Obviously a 32 year old button cell battery is probably not holding a charge anymore. The purpose of this battery was to retain the memory in one of these chips. Now once the battery dies, the memory goes. So you can still use the amp when it's on, but when it turns off, it's going to lose all of your settings and it's always going to go back to defaults. So we can still use the amp as is. But I've got a nice way to change that out to two double A's, and I'll show you that after we get to rewiring this primary here. So I went and looked at the schematic for this amplifier, but sure enough, if you just look right here, you don't even have to use the schematic to convert this thing from 115 or 120 volt operation to 230, 240. There are three links down here, link one, link two, and link three. For 120 volt operation, or 115 as they like to call it, you would just take this piece out. This piece right here isn't anything. It's not a resistor. It's All it is is just a blank taking the piece of what could be a bus wire. So we can just take that out. That's almost all there is to it. Next, you got to replace this fuse. And it says it right on here. For 230 volt, this will be an 80 milliamp fuse. And we need a 160 milliamp fuse for 115. And that's what we are using. Well, that's it. That is your conversion from 230 to 115 operation. I know it says 115. I can't stand saying 115 because the voltage in the United States has been 120 volts since I've been alive. And I'm much older than this amplifier. Anyhow... Let's move on to getting the battery replaced. They do have a battery holder you can replace this with, so you can replace this with button cell batteries, but I think taking all of this stuff out to get to the battery is a little excessive, even though it should last at least a decade. I toured with one of these amps, and I had two double A's in that position, and it lasted me from about 2000. 13 until last summer. So that was about 10 years. So I actually have a sacrifice here. We're going to have to make 
to get our battery pack. Now, of course, you can get these. I used to get these from Radio Shack, but Radio Shack is no more. So we shall have to improvise here. And of course, I'm sure Amazon or what other, any other electronics vendor, you can get a double A battery holder, no problem. All right, that's it. I just replaced this wire because I wanted it to have a little bit of a cleaner look. I wish there was a little bit of a strain relief there, but that's all right. It's not like this is going to be manipulated to the point of breaking anytime soon. Now basically, the process on this is simple. You take the battery out and put the red wire on the positive side and the black wire on the negative side. Done and done. So let's go ahead and get this battery out. And now we have to make a decision on where we want this battery pack to go. Now, do you want to do this with no mods to the chassis? Sure. Then maybe you can put it over here with some Velcro, tie the wires in. And the way I've done this on another JMP1 that I toured with was I just drilled a hole through here, ran my wire through, and I had my battery pack Velcroed to the top of the chassis. That way I could access it without ever having to take it out of the rack. You can also Velcro it to the side here, but you're going to be covering up some of the uh, MIDI input jack, so that doesn't always work very well. So as long as you don't have anything over top of it, sure, you can put it right on top there. That's not a problem. If your rack space is tight, obviously putting it on the top is not going to work. So you can also Velcro it to the side, but then you do have to take it out in order to change the battery. Everything comes with its pros and cons. All right, so I don't think there's any harm in putting it through right around here in this corner. So we can, I can run it high and tight around here so it's not going to be in the way of anything. And That seems to make the most sense as far as placement goes. I don't want to see any holes on the, on the back of the chassis. And I'm also going to use a small grommet in that hole. All right, so that looks really good. That's our hole with our grommet in there. So the wire can pass through and it's snug. So it doesn't have a lot of sl slack to it. So it won't get cut there. And so if we leave enough slack on this wire here, we can Velcro it to the side. We can Velcro it to the top of the unit and still be able to lift this off, change the battery out, put it back without having to disassemble the unit again. As far as our batteries go, we can go ahead and load them up. Our battery pack is mounted firmly on the side here. It won't come off. Wiring secure. We've converted it to 120 volt operation. Now let's see if it works. Now I actually made a mistake, not by drilling through the side here, but I forgot that the panel for the top actually goes over the side. So I had to pop my dual lock off and I actually had to take a unit bit and notch out a piece of this chassis right here, this chassis cover. So not the end of the world. So we'll just put another piece of dual lock right here. And we can just pop our battery right back. All done. All right, so I've not turned the amplifier on yet. What I'd like to do is run this through my light bulb limiter because we did mess with the primary of a transformer. We want to make sure we didn't do anything stupid like short out those wires on the chassis because maybe, you know, the leads are too thick or the solder dripped down and is touching the chassis. So the light bulb limiter will prevent any damage. We've got the Variac set to, it's at 118 volts. And let's go ahead and power the amplifier on. To do the factory reset, you hold OD1 and clean one. And there you go. So we're on patch double O, Let's go to one of those channels that was screaming before. 
And now everything, all the channels seem fine. There doesn't seem to be any issues. A lot of funny stuff can happen when that battery dies. You'll get screaming and squealing on different channels. The volumes may not be right. Some of the controls may not work correctly. Now this data knob is always kind of funky. It'll jump around between like two and three different uh, patches when you turn it. So right now we've got it on a uh, 19, which is a JCM 800 setting. Just want to try 20, and then we're going to program one. Turn it off, turn it back on, make sure our program says save so we can verify the battery swap was correct. pretty good I like that so let's see I don't want the bass shift that's a pretty good starting point so let's save this so you want to go store and let's just make our preset somewhere high up like uh, Turn the unit off. Well, there you go. It's turned back on and it's returning to the channel that it was last left on. And also, it saved the settings there. So, the conversion didn't take very long, neither did the battery swap. So, as long as you have all the parts on hand, this is a 15 20 minute job. And it only took us a few minutes to program a setting that we really like. So let's go ahead and hear it. I just threw a mic on a Marshall cab and I'm going to run through a couple riffs real quick. sounds great to me and that was a fairly painless process to go through. I will include a schematic and a copy of the handbook for this amp in the description below. Hopefully this video will help you out if you ever have to work on one of these preamps. If you want to get creative you can certainly select between the two different primary voltages by using a switch. Mounting it would be a little bit tricky but it definitely can be done. In a future video I'll go through how to get this data knob from being so laggy and bouncy. Again thank you very much for watching and hopefully I'll see you on the next one.